Amen. We thank God for everything that he is doing and everything that he has done and everything that he's going to do. Well, praise the Lord. Amen. First of all, amen. I want to say amen that um, I had a uh, auntie to pass, amen, recently, amen, my auntie Katie Clark, amen, of Atlanta, Georgia, amen, she transitioned and went on to be with the Lord, so I'm asking your prayers and support, amen, for the Clark family of Atlanta, Georgia, amen, amen, thank you so very much, amen. Well, amen, today, amen, we're going to walk through the word one more time, amen, we're going to walk through the word, and uh, today our scripture reading is coming from Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 11. Oh, glory to God. Amen. Romans chapter 10, verses, uh, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 11. And it reads thusly, amen. Read along with me if you have your Bibles. That if you shall confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Good Lord of mercy. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whosoever believes on him shall not perish and shall not be ashamed. Praise the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. I want to use as a subject today, the heart of a, belie of a believer. The heart of a believer. Praise the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, uh, first of all, amen, when we talk about the heart, I want you to understand that when uh, the Bible speaks of the heart, uh, it is uh, the heart of man, it is speaking of the spirit of a man. The heart of man is the spirit of a man. And the spirit is the first part of man that was created by God. Amen. God first created the spirit of a man. And then, praise the Lamb of God, uh, he made the body of a man from the earth. Amen. Called the flesh or the body. And then God formed the soul of a man by breathing into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Now, I want you to understand that uh, the man is made up of three parts. Amen. He's made up of spirit, of body, and of soul. Now, the spirit of a man is the part of a man that knows. It knows things. It knows everything. It knows God. It came from God. The spirit came from God. And the spirit knows God. Uh, the body of the man, a man was made from the earth, as I said, and it reacts to the soul and the spirit. The body or the flesh reacts to the soul or the spirit. And the soul of the man, a man, uh, is that a man where the innermost, a man, um, um, the innermost, a man, motions um, comes from, a man, uh, Wherever you, what you think, amen, and what you believe, amen, uh, your emotions come from the soul, amen. Now, I want you to understand something before I go into my message, amen, that uh, because man is body, soul, and spirit, uh, triune or tripartite, amen, it means that uh, two can agree and dominate one. In other words, if the spirit and the soul connects together in unity and harmony, it would dominate the flesh. But if the soul, amen, and the body or the flesh connects together, it has the tendency to work against the spirit and would dominate the spirit. So, amen, uh, that's why we need, amen, a born again spirit. And we 
need a, a transformed soul or a transformed mind or renewed mind that will agree with the spirit so that the spirit and the soul will dominate the flesh, dominate the soul body that wants to react and do whatever it wants to do. Amen. So having said that, amen, let's walk through the word, amen, for a moment. Now, uh, John 3 and 12, John, St. John 3 and verse 12 says, uh, if I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? That's Jesus talking. And no man has ascended up to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, even the son of man, which is in heaven. Hallelujah. Jesus was talking about, I got me a place in heaven that I'm going back to, but I came down from heaven, but I'm going back and I'm going to be seated on the right hand of the power in heaven. Amen. Uh, verse 14, Jesus said, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Hallelujah. Jesus was saying, Amen, that uh, just like Moses lifted up the serpent that represented sin and Satan, Amen, that he was going to be lifted up on the cross as a, a remission for our sin, that he was going to die on the cross for all of our sin. Amen. And, and verse 15 said that whosoever, whosoever believes in him should not perish. Good Lord of mercy. If you believe in Jesus, you should not perish, but have eternal life. Glory to God. The heart of a believer, the spirit of a, of a, of a believer. Now, now, I want you to understand something, amen. In the 17th century, uh, an English clergyman uh, named Thomas Fuller said, um, seeing is believing, but feeling is the truth. <laughs> he said, seeing is believing, but feeling is the truth. What you feel is the truth. Now, we know that uh, the saying seeing is believing is not necessarily true. Now, we know that. Amen. Um, now, we know that seeing is, uh, is believing is not necessarily true and uh, because there are visions that we see. There are illusions that we can see. Uh, visions and, and uh, illusions can distort one's perception so that what we think we see does not correspond with what we physically see there, what's physically there. It doesn't correspond with it. Uh, for instance, as a, in a mirage, amen. Uh, illusions, amen, uh, derail the process. Illusion derails the process. Through the sensations, um, may, though the sensations may seem to be accurate, uh, the perceptions are not accurate all the time. They are not accurate. Uh, here's the question. Here's the question right here. Is it seeing is believing or is it believing is seeing. Hmm. Selah. Think on that. Think on that. Ponder. Think on that. Think on that. Hallelujah. Is seeing is believing or is believing is seeing? Hmm. Something to ponder. Some would say that what you see, you must believe. What you see with your eyes, you must believe. For instance, when it comes to perceiving other people's emotions, uh, then you believe what's revealed in their emotion. So then you see, you have to, uh, so then what you see in a person's emotion, you have the tendency to believe that that is their 
true character. Now, that's who they are in life. You have a tendency to believe that because you see the way they act and the way they carry on, the way they behave, amen. Uh, you say, now that's who they really are. And it's based on what we see. Uh, let's walk through the word. John 20 and 19 says, then the same day at evening, it was evening time, being the first day of the week, meaning it was on a Sunday, when the dawn was shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. They were afraid that the Jews were coming after them to destroy them. Hallelujah. Came Jesus and stood in the midst of them. Good Lord of mercy. Jesus being resurrected from the dead came in the midst of his disciples. And he said unto them, peace be unto you. Peace be unto you. Verse 20. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Good Lord of mercy. They were glad when they saw the Lord. Now here, here's, here's something here. here. Why did Jesus show the disciples his nail scarred hands and his pierced side? He did not want them to function in unbelief. That's why. Because unbelief cancels out faith. I'm going to say it again. Unbelief, unbelief cancels out faith. Now, we all know the story of Thomas, amen. We call him Doubting Thomas. But you got to understand the whole story. Now, Jesus, when he came first, he came to the disciples, and Thomas wasn't there. Now, notice Jesus showed the disciples his nail scarred hands and his pierced side. Because he did not want them to be unbelievers. He wanted them to believe. So now it shows, amen, that uh, they had the tendency to doubt just like Thomas. That's why Jesus showed them his hand and his side. So when Thomas came up, now let's look at the whole story. The disciples began to tell Thomas, we have seen the Lord. And uh, no doubt Thomas said unto them, how do you know that it was the Lord? And they said unto him, because we touched his nail scarred hands and we touched him uh, pierced in his side. Amen. We touched him and we know it was the Lord. So that's when Thomas said, well, I'm not going to believe it. I'm not going to believe you all until I touch his hand and until I touch his side. I'm going to see it for myself. <laughs> Now, that's reasonable, amen. Now, you know, people telling you what they done saw, but sometimes you, you want to see things for yourself. You want to know that. In other words, he was saying, if Jesus showed himself to you, then he's going to have to show himself to me. Good God Almighty. That, that, not, that might have been doubting, but he just wanted to be sure in what he believed. So while they were talking, Jesus steps through the door. Hallelujah. And appeared unto the disciples and Thomas. And uh, said unto Thomas, amen, uh, uh, Thomas, amen, touch my nail-scarred hand. Touch my side. I know I, I want you to believe. I don't want you to doubt. I want you to believe. And so uh, Thomas touched the nail-scarred hand and touched Jesus in his side. And when he did, his eyes was open and he believed. And the unbelief left. And he said, my God and my Savior. So Jesus said unto Thomas, amen, uh, uh, Thomas, you have seen, you believe because you have seen. He said, but blessed are those who believe and have not seen. That's you and me. We haven't seen the make man. We haven't touched his hand. We haven't touched his side, but we believe. God said we are blessed because we believe and have not seen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now, 
it is a fact, saints of God. Uh, it is a fact that belief comes before faith. Belief comes before faith. However, both belief and faith are needed. Both of them are needed. Uh, now, belief produces faith. Hallelujah. When you believe, amen, uh, it produces faith because faith comes by hearing and hearing comes by the word of God. So belief, when you start believing what you hear, then faith is produced through belief. And faith in God's word, watch this now, faith in God's word produces good works. Ooh, Lord, have a mercy. When you have faith in God's word, you will begin to live right. You begin to do right. You begin to practice righteousness. Amen. It's by the power of the Holy Ghost through you believing on the cross, but you begin to live a life in line with the Holy Ghost. You live right. You practice righteousness by the righteousness of God. Let's walk through the word. James 2 and 17 says, even so faith, if it has not works, is dead. Mm. That means if you have faith without good works, all you have is dead faith. Your faith is dead without good works. Hallelujah. Glory to God. When, when, when it's dead being alone, faith alone without good works is dead faith. It's dead faith. Living faith. Faith is when you uh, be doers of the word and not hearers only. Amen. You have living faith when you do good, when you do right, when you do just, when you do what's right. Hallelujah. Uh, verse 18. Watch this. James said, yes, a man may say you have faith. And uh, I have works, James said. Hallelujah. And then James says, show me your faith. Without your works, show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Good Lord. <laughs> James said, I show you my faith. My works will manifest my faith. Hallelujah. Not that he trusts in his works for salvation. He trusts in his faith, but his faith was manifested through good works. Are you with me? Praise the Lamb of God. Oh, hallelujah. Stay with me a little while longer now. And I will show you my faith by my works. Verse 19. Now look what James said. You believe that there is one God. Now there are a lot of people who believe there's one God. Oh, I believe in God. I, I believe in God. I believe, I believe. Well, James said you do well. He said the devils or demons also believe in that one God. They believe too. And they tremble. At the name of that one God. They're afraid of that God. They fear that God. I want you to know the devils and demons fear God more than you. Because the devils and demons know that there's a God. Not only do they believe, they know. So they fear God. And the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. And if you don't believe in God, you're not going to fear God. When you don't fear God and obey God, then it means you don't really believe in your heart. The heart of, of a believer. So it's got to be in your heart. It's got to be in your spirit. Your spirit has to connect with the spirit of God. And then things can get done. When your spirit connects and fellowship and unite with the spirit of God, some things can get done in your life. Hallelujah. You must have the heart of a believer. Now, listen to this now. It is possible to have faith and unbelief at the same time. It's possible. You can have faith and unbelief, amen, at the same time. The disciples had faith to, earth, to use up their authority over demons and devils. They had faith. Now watch this. They had faith to do that. In Luke 10, 17, let's walk through the word. And the summoned to return again with joy, saying, Lord, 
Even the devils or the demons are subject unto us. Do you need? That's faith. That's faith. The devils and the demons were submitted unto the disciples. Whatever they told the devils and the demons to do, they did it in the name of Jesus, in the character of Jesus, in the holy power of Jesus, because of the penis work on Calvary, the cross, the demons obeyed and submitted and were subject to the, the disciples because of their faith in Jesus. You got to have a believing heart, the believing heart, the believing heart. Amen. Now, let's walk a little more through the word again. Watch this now. Stay with me now. We're going somewhere. Don't turn. Don't you turn the page. Amen. Don't 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 turn right now. Amen. Listen to me. We're going somewhere today. We, we going deeper in God. We going somewhere in God. Amen. Today we going. We moving higher heights and deeper depths in God. If you want to go higher, stay with me. If you want to go higher, stay with me. Hallelujah. Because I'm in the word. I'm in the word. In Matthew chapter 4 and 14, and when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic. In other words, he done lost his mind. He gone crazy. And so vexed, he's vexed with demonic spirits. Listen, he's so vexed that often he falls into the fire or he throw himself and jump into the fire. And often he jumps into the water. Amen. And someone have to rescue and save him. And I brought him to your disciples. Good God Almighty. Look what they say. I brought them to your disciples and they could not cure him. Ooh, the same disciples that the devils and demons were subject to, that they cast out and came back boasting that the devils and demons were subject to them. And Jesus said, rejoice not because the devil is subject to you, but rejoice that your name is written down in glory. Amen. They rejoice in amen. And, 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 and now look what done happened. They're in unbelief. Watch this. Let's go to the word. And Jesus rebuked the devil and he departed out of him and the child was cured from that very hour. Good God Almighty, from that very hour he was healed. He was delivered. Then came the disciples to Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> then came the disciples to Jesus, apart from everybody else when they got him all alone. And they said, um, Lord, uh, why could not we cast out the devil? Why we couldn't cast that devil out? Why we couldn't cast the demons out? You, you said all oh, power is given unto you in heaven and in earth. And you, you said you gave unto us power to tread on scorpions and serpents and over all the power of the enemy. Why we couldn't cast that devil out? Now watch what Jesus said in verse 20. And Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief. You allowed unbelief to creep into your spirit. Good God Almighty. See, they hadn't seen nothing like that. They hadn't seen no lunatic, no crazy man like that, casting himself in the fire and jumping all in the water, amen, and, and just acting a fool, amen. They hadn't seen nothing like that, amen. So we, it brought in unbelief. And Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief, he said, for verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. He's saying you, 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 you un allowed unbelief because you saw the devil cutting up in a man, acting up in a man, controlling and possessing a man. You hadn't seen nothing like that. But I want you to know you can speak to a mountain to be removed. That means it does nothing too hard for God. You can do anything if you can believe. But when unbelief comes in, it cancels out faith. Unbelief cancels out faith. Hallelujah. You got to have the heart of a believer. The heart of a believer. Now, Jesus told his disciples they could not cast the demon out 
because they had allowed unbelief to creep in. Unbelief cancels out faith. It will cancel faith every time. Unbelief. You can't allow unbelief to come in. You got to believe. You got to believe. Uh, the words faith and belief are similar and will always operate through the heart of a believer. Hallelujah. Uh, faith and belief will always operate in the heart of a believer. If it's in your spirit, if it's in your heart, it will operate. But it's got to be further than in your mouth. So you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, but you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. So belief has to be in your spirit. Are y'all with me? You got to be in your spirit, not just in your mouth. You can't be just saying something. It's got to be in your spirit. Hallelujah. Let's walk through the word a little farther. Hebrews 11 and 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, we know. The evidence of things not seen. In other words, faith is built on the word of God. Hallelujah. Faith is belief uh, in a confident attitude toward God. Hallelujah. Involving commitment to his will for one's life. Hallelujah. That's faith. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, belief is to place one trust in truth, in the truth found in the Bible, to place your trust in what God said. Hallelujah. That's believing what God said from his holy word. All right. They're, they're like twins. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, let's look at John 3.16. Let me just read through this, amen, a little bit. I'm almost through. Uh, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Amen. And he that believeth is not condemned, but he that believeth not, is condemned already. Hallelujah. And this is the condemn, condemnation. Watch this now. Watch this. That light is come into the world. Jesus is the light of the world. And light is coming to the world. But men love darkness rather than light. That's why people do wrong and, and they sneak out at night and they do things in the dark and they turn all the lights off when they're doing wrong because they, 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 they don't want it to be revealed what they're doing. They're trying to hide their sin. But oh, if walls could talk, if hotel walls could talk, if hotel beds could talk, if the back seat of a car could talk, hallelujah, oh, glory to God. But we do things in secret, trying to hide in the dark. Amen. And we won't allow the light to illuminate in our lives. The heart of a believer will allow the light to illuminate their life. Amen. But men love darkness rather than light. How do you know? Because they do evil deeds. That's why they love darkness. They do evil things. They do wickedness. For everyone who does evil hate the light. If you do evil, you hate the light. You hate Jesus. That's all to it. You don't believe in your heart. If you if, if you do evil, amen, you hate the light. Neither will you come to the light. You won't even come to the light. At least your deeds should be reproved. God will reprove you of the deeds that you're doing if you come to the light. The light will show you you're wrong. You'll see you're wrong, amen. Uh, if you come, neither come to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he who does truth. Now, if you do the truth, you come to the light. You, you don't mind being people seeing you. You don't mind, amen, people seeing you. you you're walking the light, amen, that your uh, deeds may be made manifest so people can see you're living right, or at least you're practicing living right. Amen. You might make mistakes. Nobody perfect, but at least your lifestyle, you're practicing living right. Amen. That they uh, are wrong in God. That means that God is working in your life. That's why you're living right. Because the Holy Ghost is helping you. You can't live right without the Holy Ghost. But when you believe on Jesus and the cross and make the cross a point of contact in your life with Jesus, the Holy Ghost will assist you. The Holy Ghost will help you. And you can live right with the power of the Holy Ghost. You can live holy with the power of the Holy Ghost. 
but it takes the power of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. They are wrought in God. That means God has to work in you and with you. Uh, let's take a moment and deal with something right quick, amen, called predestination, because, you know, you got some people who saved and their brothers and sisters are not saved. They say, well, um, I'm saved because God predestined for me to be saved, but it didn't predestine for my brother and my sister to be saved. That's why they are not saved. Well, let's look at that for a moment, amen, just a few moments. There is an erroneous hypocabinist teaching that God has predestined some to be saved while others are predestined to be lost. Some people believe that. I want you to know today, God is not a respecter of person. God is not a respecter of person. Let's walk through the word. Acts 10, 34 says, then people, Peter opened his mouth and said, of a truth, I perceive that God is not a respecter of person. God is not a respecter of person. Not what Peter said. Verse 35. But in every nation, he who fears God and watch righteousness is accepted with him. God will accept anybody who fear him and work righteousness by the power of the Holy Ghost. God will accept you. Any man, any man, I don't care who you are, I don't care what you've done. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what you've done. If you can repent of your sin, you can be saved. The word whosoever means that none, none are excluded from being lost. Let me tell you something, saints. Every one of us can be lost. Every one of us can be lost. Let's walk through the word. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means all of us are sinners. All of us have a sinful nature. All of us were born with a sinful nature and we're sinners. We're sinners by nature. Now, sometimes we, we do it in the dark. We can cover it up and hide it better. Nobody will never find it out. But, 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 but listen, the, that's why the Bible says some people's sin go before them and some people's sin go come after them. In other words, people ain't going to know about your sin until you're dead and gone. Then somebody going to start talking. The truth going to come out. See? <laughs> so Romans 23, 23 says all of sin and come short of the glory of God. Now, Romans 6, 23a says, for the wages of sin is death. Sin is paid for by death. Now, you don't have to have Jesus uh, to die for you. You can pay for your own sins. You can pay for your own sins, but the wages is being eternally separated from God. You will be eternally separated from God, and that's how you'll pay for your sin. But, uh, uh, and none are excluded from salvation. That means everybody can be saved if they want to. Everybody can be saved if they want to. Drug dealers, homosexuals, murderers, witchcraft, sorcerers, if they repent and turn to Jesus, everybody can be saved. I don't care who you are and what you've done. Everybody can be saved. Whosoever means everybody. And none are excluded from salvation. Now, look, verse 623b. Uh, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You don't have to die for your sin. Jesus has died for your sin. Accept the gift. Receive the gift. Believe on Jesus. Believe on the cross. Believe on Calvary. And you'll be saved. Amen. You can be saved. It all depends on the fact that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. If you believe in your heart, believe in your heart, believe with your spirit. When we speak of eternal life, we're referring to the life of God through Christ. The life of God through Christ. The eternal, everlasting one who has life in himself. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And alone has given and gives immortality. Christ is the only one who can give us immortality. If we abide in him and his word abide in us, we can ask what we will and it'll be done. That's the word. Do you believe it in your heart? No. Do you believe that in your spirit? John 1 and 4 says, in him was life and the life was the light of men. 
And uh, if one does not know Christ, he abides in darkness. If you don't know Christ, then you abide in dark darkness. You're going to keep on doing things in, in secret, doing things, trying to hide, trying to cover up, doing things in the dark so nobody can't see you. Hallelujah. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world means God so loved Adam and Eve and all born through them in this world which God created. This presents the agape love, the God kind of love. Hallelujah. Um, you see, God loves in spite of and not because of. You, some people love you because you're young. Some people love you because you're rich. Some people love you because you know they're captured and, and infatuated by your looks or something, amen. But I want you to know, amen, God loves you in spite of, in spite of your sin, in spite of all that you've done, amen. He loves you anyhow. He so loved the world. God is not infatuated with man. It's not an infatuation. It's genuine, authentic love that God has for you. Even before you loved him, he loved you. The heart of a believer believes that God gave his only begotten son. Now, I'm almost finished. Isaiah 9 and 6. Let's walk through this word. For unto us a child is born. And unto us a son is given. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Hallelujah. It is proven. It is proven through the scripture, through the word of God, through the Bible, that the Lord Jesus is the Messiah. Read it from Genesis to Revelation. It all points to Jesus. It all points to him. He is the Messiah. He is the Christ. He is the great I am. He is the anointed son of God. Jesus is. Believe it or not, he is. Believe it or not, he is. And all Israel will be saved because Israel as a nation will accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. It's prophesied. Israel will accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior because Jesus came to the Jews. He came to his own, but his own received them not. But as men as received them, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Many Jews are already saved. But all Israel, as a nation, one day before it's all over, will be saved. My last scripture comes from 1 John 5, 11 through 13. Now listen to this carefully. And this is the record that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son, Jesus. He who hath the son hath life, and he who hath not the Son hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. If you believe in your heart, you'll know you got eternal life, because a change will take place in your life, and you will believe in the name of the Son of God. You know, back in 1976, I was 23 years old, and I had a dream. I went out and I prayed because of the life that I was living in sin and iniquity. My daddy had died when I was 15, and now, amen, I'm about 23 years old. And I prayed, I went outside and knelt down by a tree. And I said, God, if you're real, save me, save my soul, God, change me. I said, if you are real, if you're God, save me, change me. And I was sincere in that prayer, crying, crying. And I went home and I had a dream. And let me tell you briefly about this dream. In my dream, God spoke to me. God spoke to me in a dream. And God told me that I'm going to send a preacher on your job, and he's going to give you 
the words of life. I know I heard the voice of the Lord. Now, it may have been a dream. It may have been an audible voice. I don't know, but I know I heard his voice in a dream. And that's what he said to me. I'm going to send a preacher on your job. And he's going to give you the words of life. Watch this. Three preachers came on my job. Three preachers came on the job where I was working. I went to the first preacher and I told him about my dream and how God had spoken to me through the dream. And this preacher told me, um, uh, son, God doesn't speak to people anymore like that. He only speaks through the word. So God doesn't, that wasn't God. God doesn't speak to people anymore like that. So I said, okay, okay. So I decided to go to the second preacher. And I told him about how God had spoken to me in my dream. And the second preacher told me, well, I hate to tell you this, son, but you were listening to the devil. It was the devil. The devil is trying to deceive you. And it was the devil that told you that and not God. God doesn't speak to people anymore like that. He only speaks through the scripture or by his spirit. My Lord, I didn't even go to the third preacher. I was so discouraged and angry with God. I said, God, why would you let the devil speak to me? And I prayed to you and I asked you, why didn't you speak to me? And, and, and oh, I, I turned wild. I started living worse than, than I was before. And I was doing some of everything. I was doing it. But then all of a sudden, on the job, I was walking. And I walked up on the third preacher. And the third preacher was witnessing to a young lady. He was witnessing to her and he captured my attention and I was listening to what he said to her. And he said to her, he said, if you want to be saved, the first thing you got to do is know that God loves you. You got to know God loves you. It's called a Roman map to heaven. He's called it. He said in um, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. To be saved, you have to know God loves you just like you are. He loves you just like you are, and you have to know it. He says the first step to being saved. The second step is found in Romans 3.23 that says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He said you got to know God loves you, but you must know that you're a sinner. You are a sinner. And then he said the next thing, amen, you need to know is that God is forgiving you of your sin. Romans 5 and 8, for God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And he said, the wages of sin is death. Romans 6, 23. But the gift of God is eternal life. God want to give you eternal life. And the last scripture he gave her was Roman, was, um, was um, Revelation 3 and 20. Well, the Bible says, Jesus said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come into his heart and I will sup and fellowship with him and he will sup and fellowship with me. And he prayed for that woman and she gave her life to Jesus. And I was still standing, standing there listening. Then he looked at me. The servant name was Jerry Anderson. I'll never forget him. A man of God. He said, son, you want to be saved, don't you? I said, yes, sir. He said, do you understand what I just said to that young lady? I said, I heard you, sir, but I don't understand it. He said, okay. And he gave me this illustration. He said, this pen represents eternal life. And this Bible represents Jesus Christ. He said, he that has the son, Jesus has li have life. And he that have not the son of God have not life. And he took eternal life and placed it in the Bible. And he told me, he said, now take eternal life. Take eternal life. And I, I thought, and I said eternal life. I reached that eternal life and I pulled it out of the Bible. And I thought I had eternal life. And he reached and took the pen back and he placed it back in the Bible again. And he said, he said this pen represents eternal life. And this book represents Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. He placed it back in the Bible and said, now take eternal life. And again, I reached and I took eternal life the second time. And he again reached and he took the pen from me and said, 
He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. He said, this represents eternal life, and this represents the Son of God. And he put eternal life again in the Bible. He said, now take eternal life. And then all of a sudden, a light came on. I could see. I could understand that in order for me to have eternal life, I had to take Jesus Christ because eternal life is in Jesus. And I took the Bible with eternal life in it. And I understood that I needed Jesus. Listen, saints of God. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. If you don't have Jesus, you can't have life. Life is inside of Jesus. If you want Jesus, open your heart. Let Jesus come in. He's telling you all your life. He's been telling you, I stand at the door and knock, the door of your heart. If you hear my voice and open the door, I come in and I fellowship with you. I sup with you. I have breakfast with you and you with me. All you got to do is let him into your heart. If you want to be saved, like I was saved in 1976, 23 years old. I'm 67 years old now. Been saved a long time. As a young man, I got saved. Made some mistakes, error in my life, but God's grace is sufficient. I'm still saved. And if you want that salvation, I want you to repeat this sinner's prayer with me. The same prayer I prayed. The prayer I'm praying is the prayer that I prayed that day. And if you want Jesus, even if you're saved, why don't you sit this along with me? Even if you are saved, say this, this prayer along with me. Amen. Look up to heaven and say, Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner, and I know I was born with a sinful nature, but I know that you love me, and you gave yourself for me, and you died for me. My heart is open, Jesus, and I hear you knocking on the doors of my heart. Come into my heart and save my soul. I make you, Jesus, the Lord and Savior of my life. And if you mean that, if you meant that, just like when Jesus came into my heart, he just came into your heart. And you're born again. You're a new creature in Christ. Hallelujah. Well, saints of God, amen. Uh, we're going to continue with this message, okay? I, I, I want to do another series. I want to do a series on uh, the believing heart, amen? So we're going to continue next week and go a little deeper in that, amen? But until next time, amen, this is Bishop Bell. Amen. Um, thanking God for you. Until next time, as we once again go for a walk through the word. God bless you.